<laughs> Perfect. All right. All right. Well, um, my name is Petra Servino, and welcome to the pollinated class. Um, originally, it was supposed to be face to face, but it was moved to Zoom, which is great in its own way because this opens up the door to inviting people from outside of Idaho. And just a little bit about myself. Um, I've lived in Eagle for, uh, for the past 10 years. We moved here from the Phoenix metropolitan area and um, where we lived there for 16 years, but I was actually born and raised in New Jersey, right outside of New York City. Um, I'm a master gardener through the University of Idaho. Um, where I'm finishing up all of my volunteer hours and um, working on um, finalizing the class as well. I work um, full-time at a tech business in, in town here, and I own a small side business called the Zenful Pantry that sells barbecue rubs and fresh cut flowers for my garden. I know that's an odd combination, but maybe, but our um, slogan is providing food for the soul and flowers to warm the heart. So I'm just going to go over some basic Zoom housekeeping. For those of you that aren't as familiar with that type of format, um, I took a screenshot of the meeting and then at the bottom of the screen, you'll see there are a few buttons that you should familiarize yourself with. Um, while the presentation is on, you'll be on mute. And if you have a question or comment, just take yourself on, off of mute by clicking the unmute button on the microphone on the very bottom left hand and ask your question or comment. And for the video, if you'd like, you guys are all on video already. <laughs> um, you just, if you don't want to be on video anymore, you need to leave or whatever, <laughs> just, or get up or whatever, just uh, click on the, um, turn off the video with the turning, clicking on the camera. And then if you prefer not to comment, if you just want to type something in, just uh, move over to the center of bottom. And that is a, um, a chat button right here. And you just click on that and a button on the bottom right hand side will come open up and you can type in your question or comment. And if you need to leave the meeting for any reason, the leave meeting is right on the bottom right hand side. So um, like Irene said, she's recording the meeting. She received permission from all of you, which needs to be done. So I'm going to start. So the first thing that I want to cover today, a uh, few first few things, I, um, in order for me to get credit for volunteering, I need to go over just a few different things about the University of Idaho's Master Garden program and also um, a few things that you may not be aware of what the University of Idaho Extension Office does. I'm going to uh, discuss a little bit more about who the pollinators are a little bit of pollination 101 class. You didn't think you were gonna be going back to school. Um, what is pollination? What is fertilization? And then we're going to talk a little bit more about attracting pollinators in the garden. Um, first off, um, the Master Gardener Program, they're actually, the Extension Office is located in Glenwood in Boise. Um, that's their address, their phone number, and their website. And I will be sending out these slides as a PDF afterwards for those who are interested in learning and having my slides on hand. Uh, the Master Gardener program is offered once a year. It's from fall to the following spring and it meets approximately every other week or so for about three hours. And it's done in two different phases, 50 hours of classroom time, and instruction and training in plant science, and then 50 hours of practicum hands-on service in the horticulture field. And it's offered a limited to a limited amount of people. For example, I was waitlisted for two and a half years before I could even get into the program. And the class is, the class is taught by U of I faculty and horticulture professors who um, are masters in their field or certain specific um, topics. And it covers a list of a myriad of different things that we go over. This is just a long laundry list of what we've learned, what I am learning still to date. And it's a great class, met some wonderful people. We have about 35, 40 people in the class and um, made some new friends, which is pretty awesome too. Um, this is the application. And if you're interested, um, you can also reach out to Susan Bell. She's the uh, Master Gardener Program um, Director. What you may not know is that they actually have a plant diagnostic clinic and you um, can bring your diseased plants 
or bring a weed or an insect or um, figure out what's going on, have a question about what could be wrong with your plants, and they will figure that out for you. Uh, they just bring it in. You can either call them, leave a message, you can take a picture of it, you can send it over to them, and they will try to help you to figure out what's going on with your garden or your plants or whatever the case may be, trees, anything to do with horticulture. So I thought this is a really great community outreach uh, to our Boise metropolitan area. And not everybody may be aware of it as well. So like I said, they're on Glenwood between State Street and Chinden, right near the uh, paramedics and Hawk Stadium. So. Okay, so let's start with our little pollinators. Who are they? When you think of pollinators, um, what do, who do you think, what do you think of? Anybody? Bees. Yeah. Butterflies. Yep. Bats. Yep. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Um, according to the Idaho Department of Agriculture, there's actually 400 types of pollinators just located in Idaho. And here are just some of them. We have birds, moths, bats, and um, even um, there are some crickets, believe it or not, that are pollinators as well. Um, according to the USDA, they estimate that about 80% of the insect crop pollination is uh, com accomplished by bees, which is a pretty high percentage. So that's why people are so concerned about bees being, you know, being exterminated for various um, reasons. And this is why, also why they are so important to our ecosystem. Without the bees, there would be no almonds, apples, blueberries, cherries, avocados, cucumbers, onions, grapefruits, oranges, and pumpkins, etc. Now, flowering plants need pollinators and, and some flowers, and some flowers even have preferred pollinators. And I'm going to give you an example of that. For, um, there's an orchid flower that is pollinated specifically by the queen bee, bumblebees, because it has a floral architecture that makes it impossible for moths and butterflies to pollinate it, just because of the way the, the flower is actually constructed. And around the world, different orchid species, and they may be pollinated by different members of seven different families of bees um, and several families of wasps, nectar drinking flies, butterflies, sphinx, and settling moths, hummingbirds, etc. And right now, there's really there aren't any um, bat pollinated orchids that are we're known of, that are known. Um, but like I mentioned, there is actually um, a uh, orchid that is pollinated by crickets. So pollination and fertilization 101. So what is pollination? Simply stated, it's the transfer of pollen from the male part of a plant to the female part of a plant. I bet you didn't think that you were going to get some plant sex ed into <laughs> from a Saturday morning. <laughs> um, fertilization takes place and the production of seeds or fruits are um, you know, are started. And this usually happens by an animal, insect, or even by wind. And what is fertilization? Um, flowers are the sexual reproductive organs of the seed bearing plants, and they are designed to produce and distribute pollen, accept pollen, and provide a way to fertilize the ovary and nourish the, and protect the developing seed. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of a science lesson. Um, I, um, on a very high level, if we were face to face, I would have brought in some flowers and we would have done a little bit of a science experiment with where all of you would have some hands on lessons with flowers. This is actually how I learned in my class, my master gardener class, um, we had flowers, but since we can't meet face to face, I'm just going to go over this and show you um, on uh, a tulip that I had that is in my garden so I can show you exactly what happens. There are actually four part, major parts of a typical flower, the sepals, petals, stamen, and pistils. And not all flowers have all parts. And in the, that case, those flowers are considered incomplete flowers. 
but I'll go into that a little bit more later. Sepals are the outer covering of the flower when in the bud stage, and usually they're green and they look leaf-like. And then in some plants, they become the flower, the petals, such as my example, the tulips. So we have the sepals here. These are the outer ones. These are the petals. And the sepals collectively, they're called the calyx. And plants, including the tulips, like our example, they have the sepals that look exactly like the petals and they aren't green. And a typical tulip, there are three petals and there are three sepals, which all look like those petals. So you can't really differentiate it too much other than if you would look at a tulip live. And petals are usually the largest and the most prominent noticeable part of the flower. The color attracts the insects to pollinate the flower. And the petals collectively, they call, actually are called to get all together, they're called a Corolla, like the Toyota. <laughs> Stamens are the male parts of the flower, so, and um, they consist of the filament down here on the bottom and the anther. And the anther is actually that has the, the, the pollen on it, as you can see here from my, my photo. The pistil is the female part of the flower, and it's in, consists of the stigma which is the sticky surface on the very top and that traps the pollen. And then on the base is the pistil, which contains the ovules. I, I don't, couldn't get a really good picture of it, but it's, I'll have it in the next photo. You, it'll make a little bit more sense, but I couldn't get it. It couldn't show that actually on this um, photograph. And then the style is um, what is in between and uh, allows the pollen to travel all the way down to the ovary and the ov ovules. And this picture here to the very right is just a, um, a flat fa face on photograph of, so you can see tops down what the stigma looks like and then the anthers here on the side. Are there any questions about this? Okay, I'm gonna take your silence as no. <laughs> so this is more of a hand drawing. It's a little bit more, um, complex, probably way more information than you really want to know. <laughs> and um, so you'll see, again, the stamen and the, the um, sepal and the stigma and the male and the female parts of the flower as well. So now that you've learned about the plant, very plant basics, let's talk about the art of pollination and the role of our pollinators. For the seed to develop, um, pollination needs to occur. Pollen needs to be transferred from the anthers, right here, and, and transferred from the anthers to the pistil where it can fertilize the uh, ovary and the ovule. And that's where the bees, the birds, the moths, bats, etc., they come into play. We need them to fly from flower to flower and they have, have that sticky pollen adhere to, their an to our animal visitors. And as a general rule, the plants need pollinators to, to ha um, have pollinator plants to have be very bright and showy flowers. So they just jump from flower to flower. Some plants like corn, it, um, they actually utilize the wind and for pollination. They release large amounts of small, light, non-sticky pollen grains into the air. And they rely on the opportunity to land on the pistil of the plant close by. That's why we have corn rows. And uh, they uh, um, will pollinate that way. It actually, um, they usually have like inconspicuous flowers. You would never notice that uh, a corn plant has the, any type of flowers that are showy, like a tulip or crocus or whatever the case may be. Um, Self-pollination is done on the same plant that they don't need pollinators. And examples of this would be like po potatoes, wheat, oats, tomatoes. And even though, though they are self-pollinators, they also are capable of um, being, being cross-pollinated by bees and other, animal, uh, other animals and insects. So there's a whole cycle of pollination. It's, and pollination is just actually one process, portion of the pollination cycle. And it's just a very, obviously a very important part of it. Otherwise we wouldn't um, have half the 
or a lot of the plants that we have today. And so we already went over the, the role of the pollinators. And I told you what parts of the plant once pollination has taken place. So once that, once the ovules um, are fertilized, they have either fruit or seeds and those are dropped into the ground and then they sprout and the and then it the, grows into a bigger plant and then the whole st system it just it's almost like a closed loop uh, system and it just takes place year after year so let's turn now turn our attention over to attracting these great pollinators to our garden So as a general rule, um, plants that require pollinators, and I've already mentioned this before, is they need large and very bright flowers and petals to uh, see the, um, to be attracted to the flowers. And that wind pollinated plants tend to have inconspicuous flowers, like I mentioned with our corn plants. Um, this to me was pretty fascinating, and I don't wanna go into a whole bee session because, um, uh, they have only, you know, they have different types of vision, but I do want to just make mention of how the bees visualize because uh, they, since they have 80% um, of the pollination in according to the USDA, they are such an important part. So um, what was, what they found out was that they have, bees have amazing eyesight and just wanted to provide a little bit of additional insight about them. And here's a few tidbits that I found out that was um, pretty fascinating. The um, scientific community has been researching bees and their eyesight um, over a hundred years ago. Actually, there's a gentleman um, named uh, Carl Van Frisch. He actually got the Nobel, Pre Peace, yeah, Nobel Prize winning uh, award for uh, pr proving that bees can see color. And the color um, we see is based upon pigments absorbed in reflecting light. So you can see here that compared to what the bees see, um, compared to what humans see, is very, is, there is an overlap and then the bees can see beyond. They can also see ultraviolet light, which is not something that we can normally see. So what, how this works is um, the color that we see is based upon pigment absorbs and it reflects light. And when light hits an object, um, some of it's absorbed and some of it is reflected. And um, the, the brilliant colors in flowers is a way for attracting the pollinators such as bees and the color of the flowers helps targets the areas of nectar. And that's one of the reasons why the petals are usually a different color than the leaves. And even though humans can see more colors, bees have a much broader range of color vision. Um, they actually, like I mentioned, they have an ability to see ultraviolet light and it gives them an advantage of seeking th that nectar that I just had mentioned. And many of the patterns are on the flowers are actually invisible to the humans. And whereas they can, these um, next nectar, they call them bullseyes, are all visible only to um, animals such as bees. And they have the ability to see this because of this ultraviolet light that we are as humans cannot see. They call this quote unquote bee vision um, and it makes the nectar finding much easier. And in fact, some of, this, um, some of the flowers such as sunflowers, primroses and pansies, they have their nectar guides that only can be seen through this ultraviolet light um, that is captured by the by the bees. Um, I can go into a, a little bit more about this, but it's like uh, a little bit beyond beyond. It's it's more scientific, and um, it's, I can't. I, if I had to regurgitate it, I probably would not be able to because it's science is not my biggest strength. <laughs> so, um, but I just wanted to just kind of make you aware of how how interesting it is because the bees can see different levels of um, their vision is just so much different than what ours is and it gives them an advantage. Now, uh, one thing that was also very interesting with bees is that they see color faster than humans do. So that's why like when we're driving in a car and we'll look at a field of flowers and it just looks like this massive blur, um, bees can actually see, distinguish the individual flowers a lot better than, than we can. 
And when they fly above the flowers, they actually see the depth and three dimension of the flowers, whereas we would not see that as quickly if we were going the same speed as a bee, um, proportionately to, you know. And uh, anyway, so I thought just thought some of this stuff was pretty interesting. And it, some of the primary uh, colors that they focus on, we would think yellow, it, but actually the, the blue violet range is um, what attracts them. So it's not unusual for them to be attracted to like a butterfly bush or lavender, um, anything in that blue and purple range. Uh, also violet, not just blue and purple and, and violet, but violet is kind of like a color, I guess a, a family of the... Uh, the purples. <laughs> so I'm going to now provide a few tips for creating a um, pollinator habitat. So, so plant your garden um, so that something is always blooming, um, for starting from early spring all the way into late fall. Um, I, I actually have a tree. Uh, it's called a serpentine pussy willow tree. And uh, it's actually starts blooming in late February, early March. And first you'll have the little pussy willow, little fuzzy, the little fuzzies, fuzz, fur balls. And then those sprout into, and they have tons of pollen all over them. And my entire tree is just covered with bees early on, like I said, around end of February or so. And then the crocuses and the tulips and the, they all start blooming. And then we start getting into the summer season where everything starts blooming and then it all, and then we'll carry that over into the fall time. You have your garden. I mean, there's just a lot of things that have, have pollen. Okay. Tips for creating a pollinator habitat. Um, some of our native bee pollinators, they need a place to call home and habitat over the colder months. Um, this is often why the gardeners don't do heavy fall clippings and cleanup so that they can provide this type of environment for the pollinators. Um, even leaves on the ground, they help this type of home. So if you have like a small bare, bare area, um, they can nest in the ground. And uh, if you leave a few bare areas, they, they like to, um, solitary bees, they burrow actually into small holes in the ground. So this just gives you an opportunity to make a little bit of a habitat for them and um, you know, keep them happy <laughs> for the for the springtime. So here are some examples of different pollinating plants that you may want to plant in your garden. Um, I have all different types here and examples. Um, we have lavender, we have chives, corn, peonies, apple trees, um, butterfly bush. Here's some fennel. Um, we have some echinacea or cone flowers, tulips, irises, and we even have some um, plants. We have some, uh, it looks like, I guess, pumpkin plants or cucumber plants or something like that. So um, these are just some examples. I mean, anything that has um, flowers on it will attract your bees and your other pollinators and um, make, also make your garden look great. So I just, I just wanted to give you, provide a few different examples. And that's all I have. Do you have any questions? We had a, a few for you. Um, we have um, several large quince bushes. Uh -huh. And so if they don't, if bees don't see like those reds and pinks, then what's attracting them to those flowers? Because they're completely full right now too, or some of like those flowering plums and stuff have those deep pink flowers right now. So right. what are they seeing then? Or like, how are they getting attracted to those? They may not, they don't see necessarily the red, like they don't see red like we see red, but they all, they, um, because of, um, they'll, but they'll see a hue of red. I don't, I'm not a bee expert, but the, from what I understand is just, just because they don't see the, the actual red, like you and I see red, they do see a hue of it. Some, something okay, like that. Okay, so they're still yeah. seeing something. They're still yeah, seeing it's, it's something. Yeah, it's like infrared. It's like on one end, of the, you have ultraviolet on the one side, and then you have um, uh, uh, infrared. Yeah, infrared on the other side, side of the spectrum. Yeah. Let me just pull up that slide real quick. Hold on one second. Okay. Yeah, infrared. Yeah, you have infrared on one side. So they don't, they, they don't see all this like blatantly red, but they'll see um, 
like I guess it's a, like a like not a shadow. I'm I'm trying to find the right word for it, but like he, in hue is probably not the right word either. But something along those lines. Okay, but yeah. it won't be like in your face. But they will see that it's something bright. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think there's a question in the chat. Okay. Ria asks, will the flowers also attract wasps? Uh, yeah, potentially they will um, attract wasps as well. Not just, you know, not our, just the bumblebees. Because I've seen them in my garden as well. It, it, it's a catch-22, unfortunately. <laughs> they do, I mean, as, long, as long as they're bright, showy flowers, it has a little bit of everything. Not just the bumblebees. For plants like bulbs, like the iris and the and the tulips, uh -huh. are they still producing a seed? I guess I've never noticed that with our iris because they spread so prolifically through their bulbs. Right, their rhizomes. They yeah. Um, so are they also producing a seed that we just haven't noticed? Yeah, you, you just don't notice it. If you ever, t if you took ever the the it, apart, like if you ever sliced, you took a you know one of the heads off and then you sliced mm -hmm. it then you would see the entire anatomy. And that's what I kind of wanted to do face to face, which is kind of hard for me to do that right on a Zoom meeting. Yeah, but if you, if, you, if, you, if you actually took and dissected, dissected it, yeah, you would definitely see. And, and, with, and that's with any flower, so. Don't irises, after they're done blooming, don't some of them put out a stalk with a great, or one of those things will get really big, like it's a big seed pod on it. So, you know, not every flower, but some of them. You know, I've never let them, I usually hacked mine back before that happened. So I don't really, can't really uh, give you and tell you that. I mean, are you thinking of alliums though, Vicki? No, I've seen some of my, my iris will do that. Um, really? Okay. Like I said, not every one, but it's usually about two inches long and it's like um, sort of football shaped with uh, three or four sides on it. And it's um, kind of an olivey green about the color of the leaves. And I was always like, oh, huh. seeds, you know, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of an odd thing to see. I've never seen that. I, maybe I should let them, because I haven't had irises too long in my garden. I've only had them for like mm -hmm. about a year or two. And then I, I hacked, I hacked them to the ground in all honesty. <laughs> so I don't know, I can't speak <laughs> on that specific one, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so what would you say is your favorite pollinator plant for this area? I mean, you do lavender, which is a great one, but. Yeah, this is actually, this is my yard. This is, this is in my yard. So I, I love it because this is around like June 20th when it really starts blooming. And last year, this has happened for the first time and we've had the lavender plants for about six, seven, seven years, I guess it's been now since we've lived in the house, eight years. And I walked in between the rows and all of these butterflies started like, they were like hanging out on there and you would walk through there and they would all flutter into the air and it was just really cool. I've never seen anything quite like it before. So like, it, yeah, I have, I guess I have a partial preference to lavender. <laughs> so plus it smells good. So. Yeah. <laughs> on my list for today. Well, there you go. <laughs> There's, if you're going to buy some lavender, um, they, they don't, they don't start well with, um, from seed. So if you buy one plant and if you, um, they kind of self propagate and you'll find, no, start noticing after like a couple of years or so that this, there will be some smaller plants around it and then you can just dig them up and you can move them around in your yard. So, oh, that's nice. Yeah. So um, it doesn't happen in the first year, but it happens over like year, maybe year two or three or so after they've established themselves and you'll start seeing these little babies living next door to it. <laughs> Are they still connected to the main plant or so? You no, cut them no, they grow their own. It's, it's not a rhizome. It's, they just, they, I guess, I guess they uh, self pollinate and they just, you know, they self propagate and they grow anywhere there's dirt nearby. Because I've oh, had that happen cool. to me, and I just and I just transplant them over the in throughout the yard. Oh, so, well, yeah. that's good to know then. Yeah, yeah. and if you want, like, if, I suggest if you um, want some culinary lavender there if, to make like lavender lemonade or like lavender tea breads and stuff. There's a um, a brand called Hidcoat or Hidecoat. It's H I D C O T E. It's a really good culinary lavender, and I know that Edwards carries it. And um, if you want a very fragrant lavender, Grosso is one of the more fragrant ones, um, or like a French lavender, but Grosso actually does pretty well 
in our environment. Cool. G R O S S O, Grosso. And Thank they're pretty, they, that's what these are. I mean, so these are right here. This is my culinary lavender. And a lot of these here on the next row, those are the Grosso lavender. And they have really long spikes, about like a foot and a half to two long foot spikes that grow around June 20th or so. And I say June 20th because only it reminds because it's my son's birthday and, it, and they're usually in the height. And that's usually when the first um, bloom is. And you'll have a second bloom around August or so but it's not as pronounced as the first bloom. So information on lavender. So. Do you, Petra, do you know much about peonies? Yeah, I have a whole row of them. <laughs> I have some that um, they, they haven't ever bloomed and we've been in our house almost four years now uh -huh. and I don't know why they're not blooming. So they're not even putting buds on or anything. Do they just need fertilizer? Are they done? Or did they not get enough water? I, that's a really good question. I've never mm -hmm. had a peony not bloom. Um, right? Do you cut them down every year? Mm -mm. No, we let no. them die back and then I leave some of the stalks until about spring for the kind of like those mason bees type, but, and then I'll trim them back a little bit. I'll remove the dead stuff. Right. Uh, I just want to let them die back because I have some in the front yard that have blooms on them this year. And then the backyard ones don't have anything. That's interesting. That's um, yeah. I've never had a peony not bloom, so I'm like, I can't, I'm like, I'm a little bit at a loss for that one. <laughs> I can find out for you though. Yeah. I can do some research. Yeah. I'll write it down. Yeah, because I don't know if they're just done, if they never will produce blooms again, or if there's something I need to do to amend the soil or, or what. But I just thought that was kind of weird because there's a lilac right next to them that puts on blooms. So it was kind of weird. Yeah, that's really strange because um, I have about, I don't know, at least like 12 or 13 different um, different peony bushes and every single one of them this year has a, a bloom and I, I'll look into it and I'll, I'll shoot you an email. That's good. <laughs> Danielle, you didn't move those, did you? No, they've always been in that same spot. Because usually I'll hack mine down almost to the bottom for, and, and then they grow again and every single year. So, yeah, yeah. yeah it's odd. Kind of hmm. Hmm. Okay, I'll have to look into it. Um, anything else? Any other questions? Is there a better time to plant bulbs, like tulip bulbs? Is that tulip better bulbs. In the fall? Yeah, usually in the fall time. Before, and um, because we had such a mild winter, I planted even some of my bulbs in November. They just end up um, blooming a little bit later. Okay rather than March. So as long as the, the ground is in solid, rock solid hard, you can plant them in the fall time. Okay, cool. I yeah. think that's just an easy way to add that early color for us since nothing else is really up. We have a lot of fall color, like with the tick seed and the rudbeckia, but not, not really early stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's a good way of doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're usually, those are the first things that bloom anyway, is this, you know, the crocuses and, you know, those tulips and whatnot. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. So that's all I have really. So um, any other questions before we close up for the day? Oh, thank you. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Petra, for doing this class. And I will um, post the recording on the website at some point so that other people can also watch it and learn. So Okay, Thank cool. you very much. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye.